Good morning. Good morning. God has been good to us again. He's blessed us to be able to rise from our sleeping beds last night and to come here and corporately gather around the table and fellowship and sing songs one with another, all with the express purpose of worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Welcome to those visitors who may be visiting with us either in person or you're enjoying our live stream. We know that you could be other places, but we are delighted that God put the intent in your heart to worship with us this morning. And for that, we are tremendously, tremendously grateful. We're happy again to have those visitors with us in person. I'm glad to see uh, my grandsons who came to see us. And yeah, they brought their parents with them. <laughs> it's, it's good to have the Mallet family um, with us. And uh, we always enjoy when they come and visit. And good to see them getting right to work. Eric led the prayer, and, and, and Michael will lead us in closing prayer. And you didn't know this. My other grandson, Mason, was the song operator this morning, pushing the buttons and advancing, advancing the slides. So they all did just a tremendous, a tremendous job. I'm glad to see everyone this morning. Glad to have the chance that we can fellowship and that we can worship together in spirit and in truth. Those who are visiting with us either in person or online, we invite you to come back the next opportunity and worship with us here at the Church of Christ in Trent. Few, uh, few, few housekeeping things, few announcements and information I want to give you and then we'll get right into Matthew 6. Remember I told you last Wednesday that uh, I was going to visit the uh, Jim Ned Valley Church of Christ in uh, Tuscola. Um, I did that. The guest speaker uh, was a man who I had to meet because his first name is Freddie. And, and I just had to meet another Freddie. His name was Freddie Anderson, who has been involved in prison uh, ministry, specifically working with death row inmates for the last 30 plus years. And he um, actually spoke to their youth, that is their middle school and high schoolers. And, I gotta say a word about the church in uh, in, in Tuscola, Jim Ned Valley. Though that event was a big success, I was surprised how much that church has grown. They have seen almost exponential growth over the years, and 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 they're just doing a fantastic job. I wanted to meet Brother Anderson because my intent is to work on getting him here to speak to the to the students at the uh, at the trip school. My intent next week is to reach out to Mr. Garcia and get an appointment with him. I think that would be a good community service project for us to kind of host him being here. And in my head, I will we'll, we'll filter this out and flesh this out, but in my head that weekend looks something like this. Brother Anderson can go up to the school on like a Friday and speak to the, to the kids, to the middle schoolers as well as high schoolers because his topic is very appropriate and that is all roads lead to somewhere and what he's talked about was the importance of making choices and choices have consequences and I think that's a real message guys that our, our adults need to hear but what young people need to hear as well so I'm, I'm envisioning something like this maybe getting him in on a Friday and letting him speak up at the school. Maybe that Saturday we have some sort of a community gathering here. And then Sunday, that particular Sunday, maybe we can do a friends and family day and just kind of connect the weekend. And it might it might look like that. Again, it's in my mind, but I'll flesh this out uh, with the men and we'll, we'll make a game plan. But it was a big, big success. Those young people were captivated. He kept their attention. Um, and I just think that's a message that the students and the adults really in Trent really need to hear. So I gave him my contact information, got his contact information. He's willing to do that if his schedule allows. And I think that would be a, a good community project for us here in Trent. What do y'all, just say amen if you think that's a good idea. Amen. amen. That's all I, that's all I want to hear. Okay, I'll flesh that out and give that, uh, give that some more detail later on. Remember I said my job here is not just to keep the dust off the buildings Wednesday and Sunday. My job is to get in the community, serve, lead us in a way that we can serve this community. Singing night, Wednesday, September 29th, the last Wednesday of uh, this month. It'll be here 
at the building at 6 p.m. Um, and so we invite everybody to come out and to participate with us in our singing night. Um, if you haven't heard already, um, we're giving our deepest condolences to um, the family of Gail Williams, our dear sister. Um, we like to extend our heartfelt condolences in her passing, uh, uh, the passing of our dear sister Gail Williams. Um, you know, it, 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 her seat is going to be empty and she's going to be missed, but but we, we, we don't need to be too sad because we're going to see her again. Amen. God is going to bless us to be able to see her again. And she's in a better place now than, than us. And so we'll, we stand ready to serve the family. I kind of heard, like I said, third-hand information. I'll get more information later. Um, her services are going to be at Baker Heights, and I believe it's this Friday. When I get more information, I plan to visit the family in between church today. And hopefully tonight online, I'll be able to give you more information. Needless to say, they, they are adjusting to this new normal. Let's pray for them um, as they as things move forward and things progress. Remember, our theme for the year is a closer walk with the sun in 2021. This is the third quarter, and we're really talking around lessons about doing good. Remember, I said uh, in January, we are deliberate and we are intentional about spiritual growth. And so all the lessons that I'm preaching from the pulpit and everything I'm doing from the classes is just to make sure that you have all the spiritual ammunition you need to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So at the end of this month, we'll be in the fourth quarter, and all the lessons will go around the, the general theme of growing in knowledge. But right now, we're talking about doing good. This month, the theme is Lord When, taken from Matthew chapter 25, in verse 44, um, and lessons on hearing and lessons on doing God's word. Lord, when saw we you like this and we didn't take advantage of it. And the, the theme I'm trying to work this month is getting us to take advantage of every opportunity we can to serve in spirit and in truth. Matthew 6 is where we're going now. Um, and let's talk about benevolence, Jesus style. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 1 through 4. Let's talk about benevolence, Jesus style. The reading goes like this. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. Um, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Circle that word hypocrite. I'll be right back. I'll be right back to that. As the hypocrites do in synagogues or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come and to serve you in spirit and in truth. Thank you now, Lord, for the time that we've had to sing songs, gather around your table, partake of the Lord's Supper, and now as we get to hear your word preached. We pray, Lord, for a message that's personal and tailored, custom to each and every one of us, Lord, so that we can be better people, better servants, better sons, better daughters for you. We pray, Father, that you just allow us to always receive with meekness your engrafted word, Lord, because we know it's able to save our souls. We pray again, Lord, for Gail's family as they are adjusting to this new normal and help us um, to, to serve in any way that we can. We pray for uh, Doris Wells' family again that they're um, adjusting also to this new normal. Help us to be compassionate, kind, tender-hearted, have a heart of service 
motivated by love because Lord you loved us so we can't help but love others forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings we thank you and we love you for this and all your blessings in Jesus' name amen, amen. when you look at Matthew chapter 6 it's strategically placed again 5 through 7 is the section of Matthew that you know as the sermon on the mount but but when you when you zero in on chapter 6 you really get a, a, a good understanding and you get to see Jesus really focusing on not only what we should do but how we should do it so let's wrap Let's wrap the talk around this. Let's talk about attention getting disorder. Attention getting disorder. In other words, Matthew 6, Jesus is really trying to teach the lesson that when it comes to our giving, when it comes to our helping the needy, when it comes to our benevolence, we need to keep our service secret. Chapter 5 through 7, again, I told you, this is kind of the sermon on the mount. And, and really, you could look at this as, as really kind of a kingdom handbook. Because chapter 5 talks about our, our being examples. Chapter 6 is going to talk about how we worship. And chapter 7 is going to talk about our actions and our attitude. Chapter 5, you really could look at it as kind of a character and kind of our conduct and our code. We've got to have a kingdom attitude. What does that mean? Our thinking has got to be right. If we're going to really be children of God, then we've got to get our attitude right. The Beatitudes help us to set a proper example to realize that we are salt and we are light. If our attitude is bad, our actions aren't too far behind. And a lot of times we, we, we take credit and we say, oh, for example, this happened, so please excuse me, or I didn't mean this particular thing. Yes, you did. If the action was bad, the action had to have a thought to invoke it. So chapter 5 in Matthew really talks about how to get not only our attitude right, but we got to get our actions right. Then we move to chapter 6, and he talks about our motivations for worship, our motivations for doing spiritual service. And he talks about this really in three areas. He's talking about giving, he's talking about fasting, and he's talking about praying. And we don't talk about fasting a lot. Next year I may develop a month and we might need to talk about that. But those three things he's really talking about are motives that make us worship better, that help us worship better. You ever thought about what motivates you and why you do the things that you do? Verse 1, he starts off, and, and I love the way um, chapter 6 starts off. He says, now be careful, almost like a warning. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, not don't do it. Not, I'm telling you not to do it. You got the freedom to do it. If you choose to do that, you will have no reward from your Father which is in heaven. You know, verse 1 reminds me of what I call the great pretenders. Great pretenders are people who really, they, they only want to be seen of men. They only want to do things to get human praise and human accolades. I've told you this before. When I was younger, I had an aunt. And the only reason my aunt gave me this shirt was so that she could tell everybody and that I could say thank you in front of everybody so that she could get the glory and get the praise. When my mother heard about that, my mother was hot as fish grease. And, and almost, I had to keep the shirt, but my, my mother almost ripped the shirt off my back and gave it back to her because the motives, because the motives weren't pure. Anytime you do things, anytime we do things and the motives aren't pure, let me tell you something, it's going to tell on you and it's going to show every time. Verse 1 is a general principle about keeping your motives right. And there's an original language word in, in verse number one. It's the same word where we get our English word theater. It's almost like coming, coming to the show. 
So the, the meaning here is if you're going to do anything and, and you're going to invite people to see for a show, your motives aren't right. And your, if your motives aren't right, your attitude is not right. If your attitude is not right, your actions are not right. Your motives here in verse 1 is to be seen by others. Remember I told you I'd be back to that word hypocrite. That's a short definition biblically of the word hypocrite. It really means behind the mask. It really means an actor on a stage. And the only thing that an actor on a stage want, well, two things, the paycheck. But the second one is the applause of the audience. That's all the actor wants. And so when it comes to our service and our giving, it needs to be purely motivated, not looking for human applause or human praise. So we need to ask ourselves a question. What motivates me to do what I do now? I'll come to this later, but let me just drop this now. When you talk about giving in this text, it's not giving like the general collection that we take up in church. This was a part of the Jewish custom where they had funds available, specifically earmarked, to help people. Whether they had it um, on the street or they see people in front of the temple, didn't really matter. They had funds specifically set aside to help people. And, and Jesus noticed that some people were using these funds that they set aside, but they really weren't helping the needy out of a pure motive. They were really doing it to be seen by others. What motivates me to do what I do? What motivates you to do what we do? We always ought to have pure motives and no strings attached. Verse 2, I love the text in verse number 2. I call these people motivated lenders. And, and they have the idea when they, when they give you something, it's not really giving. It's kind of with a string attached. You ever seen the kids play this game and they, they have a cup? And under that cup is a rock, and that rock is really tied to a string, and you go to reach for that, and they pull that string, and that cup move. You ever seen that game? You ever seen that? And then they pull it again. You go right for it, and they reach it again. The motivation there is not to ever let you, <laughs> not to ever let you grab what you're trying to grab. People look for, and they want to be honored by other people. Here is the idea of somebody who is pretending to give, but they don't care about the needs. All they want is the act and the accolades from giving. And they want to be motivated by self or they want the acknowledgement from their peers. The word in this text Jesus is using is synonymous to a business term. It means you're getting your receipt. After you, after you pay for something, you are getting your receipt. That's all you wanted. You wanted validation and you wanted credit for something that you really should have been motivated to do out of a willing spirit and a willing heart. Those who give to impress other people get what they want. In fact, they get precisely what they want and no more. There was a time when I didn't really care about receipts when I went to make a purchase. It would drive my wife crazy. Because if something ever happened, you needed that receipt to go back and pr have proof of purchase. Well, one time, this thing was defective. It was truly, truly bad. And this was the one time that I did save the receipt. This was before Walmart used to do uh, store credit or, or gift cards. You had to have the receipt. And so when I went back and it was legitimately bad, I didn't want to talk to that cashier. I got the receipt. I want to see the manager. Well, that's the wrong motivation, but that's the example in this text. Because if your motivation is just to get the reward of the approval of men, then guess what? When you get the accolades or the recognition, you have gotten exactly what you wanted. You ever known people, nobody in Trent, by the way, no, nobody in Trent, but you ever known people that help people just so that they can go brag about it to other folk? You ever known, you don't know nobody like, nobody in Trent, no, I'm going to say, nobody, nobody in Trent. I got people in my family 
my family back home in Georgia. That's, that, that, that's how they roll. And you knew there are certain of my family members you don't take anything from because you're never going to live it down. You, you, you don't have them, members of your family like that, but I do. And so you learned growing up, look, I will do without and chew rocks and eat dirt before I, before I, before I have to borrow from Aunt so-and-so because you will never live it down. That's all she did. She helped people. So she had bragging rights. That's not Christian. That's not the way we're supposed to be motivated to do things. And tonight online, I'll talk about the last part of this. Our motivation needs to be anonymous. It needs to be in secret. That's why that text says, and I'll do more of this tonight, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Well, that's impossible because it's connected to the same brain. That's not what it means here. Our giving our helping needs to be anonymous. I'll talk more about that tonight. But in this, talking about people who really, you heard the expression, they like to toot their own horn. I don't know how else to say it. And they, they like to toot their own horn. They like, they don't, it wasn't out of a pure motivation. They like telling people, we helped Brother Fabel because Brother Fabel didn't have any food in his house and I had to help him and rescue him. Well, what's that about? Why don't you just do what somebody did for my wife and I years ago, and to this day, we don't exactly know who it is. We think we know, but we don't know. There was somebody, and it was it was right on time. We were a younger couple, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been here. If you haven't, use your imagination. We had too much month left at the end of our money. I don't know, okay, so y'all understand. Oh, never we, and, and food was short. Food was scarce. And we came out, uh, somebody rang the doorbell, and there was two bags of groceries, just regular groceries, on our on our doorstep. We looked, there was no car. Um, and somebody, and that was almost 30 plus years ago, I still remember that. We think we know who it was, but it doesn't matter. They did it right. They knew God just put on their heart to bless us. And it seemed like God's blessings come right on time, don't they? Amen. God, God knows those blessings come right on time. I think we were down to the last can of tuna fish and the last pack of crackers. I think. I think we were down to that. But that's how God used us and God blesses us. Don't be the kind of people that when you give to the needy, when you help somebody, shush. Don't try to toot your own horn. Let me give you two scriptures and I'll wrap this up and I'll finish this online tonight. Luke chapter 18. I love this text. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other one a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And in my brain, I can't prove this, but in my brain, I think he pointed. <laughs> in my brain, I said, and not even like this tax collector. I, okay, I'm sorry. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood a distance, and he wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breasts and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Why did I go to that scripture? Our attitude has to match our actions, being cocky and being full of ourselves, have never been appropriate service in our Lord's kingdom. Here's one more. Luke 12, and then I'll give you the wrap up, and then I'll finish the rest of this tonight. Luke 12, the Bible says the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. So that, uh, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich 
towards God. Is it bad to have an abundant harvest? Absolutely not. Is it bad to build bigger barns? Absolutely not. Is it bad uh, to just store things up for the future? Absolutely not. But when those plans do not collide with sharing with other people and using what you have to further advance God for other people, Houston, then we have a problem. So let me wrap it up like this. What's the key point? What's the What's the takeaway? And I want you to think about this, and then we'll finish this online tonight. You can give and not love, but you can never truly love without giving. And see, one of the things we need to understand is as we move forward and as the church here continues to expand and we get into the community, we need to make sure that our motives are right and our motives are pure, that we're doing what we're doing out of a sincere heart, the, the, the ability to want to give, to help people, and we don't want the credit for ourselves one iota at all. Because why? That's not the right thing for us to do. So join me online tonight where I'll finish this Matthew 6 text and, and what I'm calling attention getting disorder. And I'll talk about the third one, which I call anonymous spenders. These are the people who give in secret. Their, their, their motivation is right. And we can learn a lesson from each and every one of these anonymous spenders. You know, though, I never want us to come together without time for personal reflection and an opportunity to ask for prayer. There are times in life where you might be up against something and you shouldn't try to handle it on your own. God is there for us. God loves us. God is sovereign. And this opportunity in just a few moments is for us to ask for prayer. And I said this before and I'll keep saying this. If we have sin in our life that hinders our relationship with God, you can still be a good person, but you're just a good sinner until you have obeyed God the way God says to obey him. Everybody in the Bible, everybody comes to God the same way. They've heard his word, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed Christ being willing to be baptized in water for the remission of their sins, that act of obedience causes them to be added to the Lord's church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 46 and 47. But you know, there are times when I'm facing something in my life, and you are too, that I need prayer. I need to be able to say, I, I can't handle this. I need my brothers and sisters around me. I need my brothers and sisters to pray for me. If you have a prayer concern in just a moment, we are going to stand and sing softly and tenderly. We, we invite you to come forward. We don't need all the sort of details of all of this. Quite simple. It's quite a simple statement. I've sinned or here is my prayer request. And not only will we pray for you, we'll minister to you. Whatever physical needs you might have, we're going to try our best to meet those needs. And we're not going to tell everybody uh, in Taylor and Nolan County, we're going to help because it's the right thing to do. If you have a prayer concern, whatever needs you have, we invite you now to come forward as we stand and sing the words to softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.